I moved my boat to a new location to start a whole new chapter in this story. As far as my first boat is concerned, this trip is the crowning achievement of an undertaking that kept me busy for the past couple of months. And before I could even think of driving anywhere, I first had to get the engine ready for such a long trip. One of the most urgent fixes I had to do was to replace the engine mounts. As you can see here, replacing these was way overdue, but before I could even do that, I first had to figure out a way how to get them out. The solution I came up with was to simply lift the engine just enough so that I could remove the engine feed one at a time and replace the rubber mounts underneath. I ordered the new mounts directly from the German manufacturer Meinert, who were really helpful in figuring out exactly which hardness of rubber I should choose. All I had to do is to add some nuts to get the new mounts at the same height as the old ones. And so I got everything ready to be able to remove the mounts, first the two rear ones. I added some zinc aluminum paint before putting the mounts back, even though that spot was not prone to rusting heavily. Next all I had to do is to put the engine foot on top and bolt it back to the engine. Now let's release the engine back down and put some pressure on the new mount. Next I lift it back up to remove the foot on the other side. Here too, after I remove the engine mount, I use some brake cleaner to remove the worst in terms of oil and grease. Then I spray some zinc aluminum paint and then put the new engine mount in. And I top it off with a large washer. After I put the engine foot back, the two mounts in the rear are done. Next I attach the bracket to lift the engine to the front of the engine. I moved my engine gallow further forward so that I could raise the engine in the front. Here I have to remove those four bolts to remove the foot. Now let's replace the engine mount. And then I can move on to the last foot. And right when I thought that this was almost too easy to be true, for some reason on this side only the nuts came off the bolts, leaving the shaft of the bolts in place, preventing me from removing the foot. Luckily, this engine mount was still okay, so I just left it in for the upcoming trip. And so with that, the work is done and I can lower down the engine for the last time. And here they are, three out of four brand new engine mounts. And of course I added some thread locker to prevent the bolts from undoing themselves. So now it's time to start the engine. Right away I noticed the difference with the old engine mounts, I guess mainly because now the engine is actually attached to all four of them. All in all I have a good feeling about this, so now we can drive. For several days before the trip I took great care to get the boat ready for the seven hours of driving that were ahead of me. After a last round of checks, all I had to do was to start the engine. And just like that, I was off to a new adventure. Of course, that meant that I had to leave behind my beloved platform boat But there's no turning back. From here on out, I only know one way, and that is forward. As mentioned before, 
The trip would take about seven hours. It leads right through the city center, across one of Berlin's famous lakes, all the way up to the northwestern edge of Berlin. Of course, I didn't do this all on my own. For such an undertaking, you best have a reliable friend on your side, ideally someone you've worked with before, just to make sure you always have enough hands on deck for any type of scenario that could come up. And so we went, for hours on end, past some of Berlin's most iconic landmarks, past this little houseboat village, and through seemingly endless canals. We only had two water locks on a 38 kilometer trip. When arriving at the water lock, I would radio in to ask for passage. Here's an example of how that went. Here is Sportboot Nofretete an Schleuse Plötzensee, bitte. Over. Guten Tag, wir würden gerne schleusen. Over. And so after waiting for the light to turn green, we entered the water lock. For navigation I used Navinaut. Very much like Google Maps for waterways, the software will calculate the best route according to my boat's dimensions and average cruising speed. Especially interesting to me is their new AIS receiver, which allows you to track basically any non-recreational vessels on the waterways. This comes in very handy in curved and narrow waterways such as here in the city center with lots of bridges, often only leaving space for one of these big boys to pass underneath. Driving such an old boat where much of the mechanical infrastructure requires maintenance or replacement, it's best to make regular checks of the vulnerable spots. While my friend was mainly driving, I did regular checks of the mechanics, for example of the drive shaft, to make sure the stuffing box is lubricated with a small but steady flow of water. I also kept an eye on that nasty exhaust muffler. And of course I did my checks inside the engine room adding fuel if needed, looking if there were any oil leaks, etc. Speaking of oil leaks, very early in the trip I noticed that the transmission oil had almost completely spilled out. It turns out this happened when we revved the engine above around 900 rpm, where due to the increased heat and pressure the oil managed to spill out, indicating a broken gasket or maybe just some loose bolts. Anyway, reducing the RPM to about 700 would stop the oil from leaking. The rest of the trip was pretty uneventful. The weather conditions couldn't have been more ideal. Zero rain, zero wind, lots of sunshine. And so we went ahead peacefully toward our destination. Once arrived, we just had to dock the boat at the shore. Tie it up safely. Turn off the engine. And with that, the trip was over. For me this mainly means a huge relief, because this new spot for my first boat is hugely important for my upcoming project. More on that in one of my next videos. Hopefully I'll see you there.